Preach the word, brother. Good morning, Mesa Church. As always, let the church say amen. amen. Let the church say amen again. Amen. And let the church say amen one more time. Amen. amen. We do have an amen audience right here, so that is encouraging. Uh, before I get into today's message, I just want you to know that I am emotionally overwhelmed, as I believe many of us are, given the state of our country, given the state of our nation. And before I get into the message, I just want to take this time out to say thank you for the many members, friends and family members who have reached out to me with affirmations of support, of love, of encouragement, empathy, and understanding. And I don't want to make this too political, but I would like to say that no matter where you stand in this civil unrest, I ask that you remember the words of Jesus, as he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. No matter where we see ourselves in this situation, our motive must always be love. I want to invite you to the subject this morning. Ten healed, but one hallelujah. Ten healed, but one hallelujah. And we're going to look at the text from Luke chapter 17, verses 12 through 19. So I looked at the numbers regarding COVID-19, and they were somewhat depressing initially. So as of right now, or as of last night, there were 1.8 million confirmed cases here in the U.S. And there are also 105,000 deaths. However, those who have been healed, those who have recovered, the number is 390,000. I would say that deserves a hallelujah. Amen. In fact, I'll even ask the question, where is the hallelujah? In this message, I want us to focus on the blessings of God. I want us to focus on the good things that God is doing in our lives so that we can have a hallelujah moment. In Luke chapter 17, verses 12 through 13. It says, as he was going to a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. We see Jesus here entering to this village in between Samaria in Jerusalem, and he encounters 10 men with leprosy. As you see on the screen, leprosy is a horrible disease to have. Let me give you some facts about leprosy. Leprosy was a disease of the skin that often resulted in a lot of pain, disfigurement, infection, and even a slow death. Research says that the disease could take up to 30 years for it to run its course and claim its victim. In fact, with leprosy, entire limbs could simply fall off. Those infected were removed from their family. They were removed from their friends. They were removed from society. There could be no contact whatsoever with children, with grandchildren, with your spouse, those that you would normally hug, kiss, and embrace, you had to maintain about 100 paces away and then identify to them that you were unclean. A Jew with this disease would not be allowed to enter into the temple. They would not be allowed to worship or make sacrifices to God. 
It was horrible. One thing I want to emphasize, it says that 10 men who had leprosy met Jesus. They met Jesus. They met Jesus with their problem, but Jesus met them with his pity. They met Jesus with their sickness, and Jesus met them with his sympathy. They met Jesus with their condition, and Jesus met them with his compassion. They met Jesus with their mess. Jesus met them with his miracle. When we approach Jesus in faith, he approaches us with favor. So I want to encourage you to meet Jesus right where you are. And I know we haven't been able to meet Jesus in familiar ways. And many of us are in distress. Many of us are hurting. Many of us, many of us are in pain at this moment. But we can meet Jesus right there. And it says, they stood at a distance and they called out in a loud voice. Church, we can always call to Jesus in our pain and in our despair. By law, they could not approach Jesus. By law, they could not go to the priest. By law, they could not go to familiar places of worship. So, so what do you do? When you can't approach God in familiar and normal ways. Well, we do what the lepers did. They simply called out to him. Because of this pandemic. Approaching Jesus. Is, is different. It's unusual. It's not familiar. But I encourage you to call out to him right where you are. It was in their calamity, it was in their misfortune that they call out to Jesus begging for his mercy, begging for his help. I wonder if they were without suffering, would they still seek Jesus? If they were without suffering, would they still be willing to meet Jesus? Church, in our suffering, if it results in our salvation, in our suffering, if it results in us coming closer to God, then guess what? It was worth it. Amen, Walls. In Luke chapter 17, going into verse 14, when he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went they were cleansed. Proverbs chapter 15 verse 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. Let me remind you that God is omnipresent. That means he's everywhere. Let me remind you that God is omniscient, which means he's all-knowing. God sees us. In our pain. God sees us in our calamity. I'm reminded of the story of, of Hagar and Abraham. As she was Abraham's servant. Who later became his wife. And in her pain and in distress. After, after bearing Abraham's son. She was abused by Sarai. She was kicked out of the home. And she was in the wilderness. Crying and begging in despair. And God met her there. And her response to God in her pain, she called God El Roy, which means God sees me. I'm here to remind you that, that God sees you, that God sees me, that God sees everything that's going on right now in our country. God sees everything that's going on right now in our homes. God sees what's going on in your heart. When Jesus sees you, he sees 
your health. When Jesus sees you, he sees your heart. When Jesus sees us, he sees our sin. He sees our sorrow. He sees our secrets. He sees our trauma. He sees our disease. He sees our past. He sees our present. He sees our future. He sees our evil. He sees our divisiveness. But he also sees our good. And when God looks upon us, when when Jesus sees us, he sees us with judgment sometimes. Sometimes he sees us with mercy. Sometimes it's compassion. Sometimes it's, it's vengeance. How does God see us right now? Knowing the state of our world, knowing the state of our country, how does God see us? I don't know, but I know he's watching. Let me ask you this question. When do you see Jesus? When do you see Jesus? Do you see Jesus only in your pain? Or do you see Jesus only in your pleasure and only in the blessings of life? If the eyes of Jesus are upon us in all circumstances, shouldn't it be that we see him in all of our circumstances? Amen, lights. Jesus says this. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priest. And they went, and as they went, they were cleansed. In our disease, in our discomfort, what does Jesus expect from us who meet him? In our disease and our discomfort, what does Jesus expect from us who call out to him and help? Jesus expects us to trust him even if our circumstances remain unchanged. Look at the text. Jesus sent them to the priests because the priests would examine the person with leprosy and determine them to be worsening or cleansed. And if they were cleansed, the priest would give them a certificate of cleansing so that they can re-enter society, so they can re-enter the temple, so they can be integrated back into normal, everyday life. But notice in this text that Jesus says, show yourself to the priests, and there's no indication that they have been healed. There's no indication that they were cleansed. They weren't immediately healed when they encountered Jesus. They weren't immediately healed when they asked Jesus to have pity on us. They weren't healed the moment they requested the mercy of God. The text says, and as they went, they were healed. So they were healed on their way. That takes a lot of faith, doesn't it? Jesus told them to go show yourself to the priest. Go show the priest that you are healed, but without clearly clearly assuring them that they would be healed and without any evidence to show the priest that they were healed. That takes a lot of faith. Here they are walking away from Jesus, still with leprosy, on their way to the priest. But guess what? They didn't complain. They didn't say, Jesus, look, you want us to show ourselves to the priest? Look at us, we still have leprosy. They didn't complain. They didn't throw a temper tantrum. They didn't ask Jesus any questions. They didn't say, well, but Jesus. What did they do? They responded in faith. Church, how many of us desire the reverse? We often say to Jesus and and, and, and say to ourselves that when Jesus heals me, then I'll obey his commands. When things get better in my life, then I will go to worship. Church, I see here Jesus operating as a true Physician, right? 
The Bible tells us that Jesus is the great physician. Let me give you an example. Let's say you have some symptoms. Let's say you have an illness. What do we do? Well, we pick up our phone, we call our primary caregiver, and we make an appointment. Once they have determined that we can come in and see them, we go. We go, we allow the doctor to examine us, we explain to them our symptoms, and they listen, and then they write a script. And they say, go your way. Go show yourself to your family. Go back to work. Go to the pharmacy and pick up your prescription, for you will be healed. Are we healed the moment we step into the doctor's office? No. Most of us feel just as miserable when we walk out of the doctor's office, unhealed. But we walk out in faith, trusting that we will be healed. And I see Jesus doing the same thing. Jesus is operating like a physician. He's sending them out, guaranteeing that they will be healed by the, do- by the time they meet the priest. Luke 17, verses 15 through 16. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice, and fell on his face at Jesus, at the feet of Jesus, giving him thanks. And then Luke says this. This is important. Now he was a Samaritan. Once this man was healed, as he was going his way, once he realized he was healed, he made a U-turn and he came back to Jesus. And when he saw Jesus, he approached him with a loud voice, and he basically said, Hallelujah, I've been healed. And he falls down at the feet of Jesus, and he begins to worship Jesus. I believe some of us are walking around healed, but without a hallelujah. Many of us are walking around with answered prayers, but we have forgotten to give God our hallelujah. The ten lepers shouted for healing, Jesus, heal us. But only one shouted with a hallelujah. Church, many of us have become apathetic to God's blessings. And I wonder why. Many of us take God's blessings for granted. And if I'm being honest, I do too sometimes. I think sometimes we arrogantly believe that because we obey God, because we are children of faith, that God ought to bless us, that God ought to heal us. Church, let me explain something. God has not promised to always rescue us. Amen. God has not promised to always rescue us, but God has promised to redeem us. And that's, that's used important. only here in the New Testament, and it's never used in the Septuagint. So this is a rare word, and as Kostenberger says in his commentary, he says, Paul's recommended... Cor- Maybe we haven't been humbled enough to give God our hallelujah. It's been my experience working as a counselor that those who have gone through something traumatic, those who have experienced despair, those who have experienced deep, debilitating poverty, that these seem to be some of the most gracious and thankful people. Maybe we don't give God our hallelujah because we have not been severely humbled enough. Maybe we arrogantly deserve, believe that we deserve the good that comes our way. 
Let me give you an example of a hallelujah moment. Right now in, at my home, I have my best friend there, and he's traveling to Texas with his family. Well, on his way to, uh, to Arizona from California, his car began to have some, some, some issues. So when he arrived in Arizona yesterday, it was about 110, he, he began to work on his car in the Arizona heat. He was out there for roughly three hours. I'm calling him every hour. Hey, man, are you okay? Hey, man, it's hot outside. Hey, you need to come, come to the house, get some food, drink some water. And he said, no, I'm okay. I'll be all right. I'm almost, I'm almost finished. So finally, he comes to the house. And about 20 minutes later, he lays on the couch. And he lays there for hours and hours and hours. He naps for about 12 hours, and he wakes up early in the morning, maybe 3 a.m., 2 a.m., and he said, I don't know what came over me. I felt horrible. I think it was the heat. And at that time, I went to sleep, woke up in the morning, and you know what I woke up to? Loud gospel music playing in my home. And I thought to myself, why is the TV up so loud? I walk downstairs, and I see my friend in the living room giving God a hallelujah. His demeanor had changed. His attitude had changed. He was alive. He was energetic. And that gospel music played in my living room for about three hours that morning. He was giving God a hallelujah. In this text, I see that, that worship is an expression of our gratitude towards God. Saying thanks to God was, was more important for this Samaritan than going to show himself to his family and his friends. He had his priorities in the correct order. He went out of his way, made a U-turn, went back to Jesus to say, Hallelujah, thank you, Lord, for healing me. The Jews, the other nine who were healed, went back to the priest. They went back to the priest so they could be approved to worship God and integrate back into society. But the Samaritan went back to Jesus. Because he realized that Jesus was the only priest who could approve him. It's important for us to know that this man was a Samaritan. We see here in this text a common crisis created an exceptional community. In their disease, they looked more like Jesus than in their healing. Where was the Samaritan supposed to go? As they were walking towards the priest, as they were walking to the temple and they were healed, there were nine Jews, one Samaritan. The Jews continued their journey to the temple, but when the Samaritan was healed, he looked around and he thought to himself, I can't go to the temple because I'm a Samaritan. I don't have a priest to show myself to, so where do I go? I could imagine that in their, in their healing, that the Jews looked at the Samaritan and realized, we can't associate with him anymore. We can't fellowship with him anymore. We can't be in close proximity with him anymore because he's a Samaritan. Their common misery pulled these sick outcasts together and making them forget the intense social hostility between the Jews and the Gentiles. You remember Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well where she said, the Jews have no dealings with the Gentiles. There was no fellowship. There was no community for the Jews and the Gentiles, for the Jews and the Samaritans. 
their disease demolished some of their social barriers. The disease of the ten men gave them a common struggle, and it brought them together as a human race. They were no longer divided because of their ethnic differences. They were no longer distracted by school. They were no longer distracted by work, sports, daily uh, pleasures. They were no longer distracted by their ethnicity when they were plagued with their disease. Doesn't that sound familiar? That in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of COVID-19, for a moment, we suspended our prejudices. For a moment, we suspended our discrimination. For a moment, we didn't see the color of each other's skin, but we saw people as people. As soon as everything was lifted, as soon as the restrictions were over, as soon as the pandemic was no longer in the forefront of our minds, what has happened? What has happened? It seems like we forgot our hallelujah moment. It seems that we forgot that we are one race of people. It seemed that we forgot that we're in this together. Let me move on before I get too political. In Luke 17, verse 17 through 18, Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? It seems that the nine Jews were only interested in the cleansing, but not the true cure that Jesus had. They were interested in the miracle, but they weren't interested in the miracle worker. The nine wanted Jesus to restore their health. But the Samaritan was willing to allow Jesus to restore his heart. Do you see that, church? The Samaritan didn't have a priest to go to. Even if he had wanted to continue to be part of this group of Jews, he would have been rejected. In fact, Jesus even shares the same ethnicity as the nine Jews that were healed. In the eyes of the Jews, the Samaritans were considered ethically and religiously unclean. We know through history that Jews were very hostile towards Gentiles and Samaritans. But after the Jews were healed, they went back to cultural segregation. I may be reading a little bit in the text, but I think this to be true. But we see here that the Samaritan rejects the cultural norm by going back to the Jewish Messiah. That's important for us to understand. He was willing to be rejected by those of his ethnicity by worshiping Jesus. Do you see that? The nine wanted to be accepted by those of their ethnicity, which were the priests, while continuing to possibly reject their Samaritan. Maybe that's why he turned around. Maybe they became hostile to him. Maybe they distanced themselves from him once they were healed. After encountering Jesus, the Samaritan chose not to abide by the societal norms of division. That's how we should be, church. For those of you who name yourselves to be Christians, For those of you who who call yourselves believers, we are not to abide by the societal norms of division, especially in the body of Christ. How are you doing in that area? I know right now our country is divided in multiple areas, but where do you stand? 
Are you standing on love? Are you standing on unity? Are you building bridges? Are you destroying walls? Are you countering the culture? In Luke 17, 19, then he said to him, Jesus says to the Samaritan, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. It seems that the others only got the outward cure, but the Samaritan got the spiritual blessing. The nine allowed Jesus to restore their health, but the Samaritan allowed Jesus to work on his heart. In fact, all who were truly healed in this scenario returned to Jesus with a hallelujah. The Samaritan's blessings will have residual, psychological, and relational benefits following this healing. And I see here that the slide is not showing what I had intended, so I'll just tell you what would be on the slide. So what do you mean the Samaritan's blessings would have residual psychological and relational benefits? Well, let's remember that this text is is really about gratitude, right? So here are seven benefits of having deep felt gratitude. Number one, gratitude facilitates new relationships. Research has shown that people are naturally attracted to people who are grateful. Number two, Gratitude minimizes physiological pain. It minimizes aches and hurts. Gratitude improves emotional health in that it decreases feelings of depression. It decreases feelings of envy, aggression, and resentment. Gratitude promotes better sleep. It improves one's self-esteem. It increases resiliency, your ability to bounce back and adapt to pain and suffering. Gratitude increases optimism, which is confidence and hopefulness. Do you see the benefits of this Samaritan? Now, what are the, what are the relational benefits? Let us remember that the Samaritan was willing to be ethnically inclusive by him returning to Jesus, knowing that Jesus, a Jew, was accepting him, was loving him, was healing him. So what are some benefits of ethnic inclusion? And I'm not talking about just us coming together once a week. I'm talking about true, intimate relationship where we are living life together. That's true ethnic inclusion. So what are some benefits? Number one, there's seven benefits to ethnic inclusion. It increases open-mindedness. So you are less closed-minded. You are less likely to be a bigot when you are including others from a different ethnicity than you. Number two, it increases pro-social behavior. In other words, you act in a more positive way in relationships when you engage in ethnic inclusion. Number three, it increases your ability to think critically. Number four, it causes you to challenge your automatic biases and stereotypes, which in turn increases brain performance. When you start to be ethnically inclusive, your baggage is going to come up. The stereotypes you believe are going to come out. Your biases are going to manifest themselves. And if you are truly striving for unity, you will become aware of those biases. You'll become aware of those stereotypes. You'll become aware of those prejudices. We all have them, but you don't sit there with them. You challenge them. You examine them. You work to get rid of them because you value unity and ethnic inclusion. Benefit number five, it increases academic performance. Benefit number six, it decreases discrimination. Well, duh. (laughs) Amen, lights. And number seven, it increases understanding and empathy. Don't we need some of that right now? Understanding and empathy. 
As I close, the Samaritan was healed from rejection as he was accepted by the Jewish Messiah and he was willing to run to the Jewish Messiah and worship. That deserves a hallelujah. He was healed from discrimination. That deserves a hallelujah. He was healed from social distancing. That deserves a hallelujah. He was healed from disease. That deserves a hallelujah. He was healed from cultural oppression. That deserves a hallelujah. <sighs> Leprosy was a common epidemic that affected entire cities. Well, sin is a common disease that continue to affect the lives of all of us. Leprosy caused distance. Let us not forget that the sin that we commit causes us to be distant from our God. The ten lepers brought their disease to Jesus. So what do we do with our sin? Well, we bring it to Jesus. Amen? Amen. Jesus healed the ten without partiality. He didn't care that there was one Samaritan and nine Jews. Jesus healed them all. Well, what does Jesus do with our sin? He saves us from our sin without partiality. Jesus healed them following their obedient faith, right? So Jesus also heals us of our sins the moment we in faith submit to baptism. I want to remind you, Jesus sees you. Jesus wants to meet you where you are. And Jesus wants to heal you. And it may not be the physical healing that you're desire, desiring, but Jesus wants to heal your heart. Jesus wants to make you whole. Jesus wants to give you an opportunity to say hallelujah. Will you respond to his graciousness? Will you respond to his love, to his mercy, to his healing? Before I close, I would like to offer a prayer. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your grace. We thank you for your patience with us. We thank you for your long suffering as you see the division, the civil unrest, the injustice, the anger, the violence, the hurt, the pain. We thank you for seeing us. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you forgive us of our sins. We ask that you help us to forgive others. We ask that you give us a heart of compassion Give us a heart of mercy. Give us a heart of understanding. Give us your wisdom so we can know how to respond, so we can know what to say. Dear Heavenly Father, maybe we need the courage to speak out. Or maybe we need the wisdom to stay silent. Because our words can be hurtful. Dear Heavenly Father, in all of this, help us to be willing and ready to approach you in prayer in submission, in gratitude. Dear Heavenly Father, heal us as a people. Heal us as a human race. Help us to examine ourselves so we can engage in the repentance necessary for this healing. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray for unity as a race. But even more so, I pray for unity as a church. Dear Heavenly Father, help us as your church to take the initiative in showing the world your love. Help us not to fall on the wayside. Help us to not be consumed by this political and racial divide. Help us to confirm our love for one another. Help us to reach out to those who are hurting. Help us to, to mourn with those who are mourn, mourning. Help us to rejoice with those who are rejoicing. Help us to be empathetic. More importantly, help us to shine our light in such a dark world. 
We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching our video. We have a lot more content here on our YouTube channel. If you'd like to get the latest notifications when we have new material come out, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell.